Gentlemen, I think we will begin. I want to welcome you all here to our second annual Ion Ritsu lecture. And I'm delighted to have our colleague, Professor Dennis Delatank, who's the visiting Ion Ritsu Professor of Romanian Studies here at Georgetown and also Emeritus Professor from the School of Slavonic Studies in London, uh, to give us a talk today. We've had Professor Delatant with us for the whole year as a colleague, and we're looking forward to having him next year, and it's, uh, we're learning a great deal from him. He has a very distinguished career. Um, before I go into his publications, I will tell you that um, he was appointed to the board of the uh, British government's know-how fund for Central and Eastern Europe in the 1990s, as a result of which um, he received from the British government, uh, he was made an officer of the Order of the British Empire in 1995, which is indeed a very, a very great honor. Um, he's the author of a number of monographs um, on Romania and on Central Europe, um, uh, the latest one being Ion Antonescu, Hitler's Forgotten Ally, from 2006. He's currently researching a study of British clandestine operations in Romania in World War II. And tonight he is going to talk about the Romanian Revolution of December 1989, which to us still remains, some of us remains a bit of a mystery. So well, delighted I, to have you here. Thank you, Angela. I hope uh, that it won't be such a mystery after I've spoken, <laughs> although I won't guarantee it. Um, we, of course, hear a lot about the Arab Spring, and we tend to forget now the spring of Central Europe, Central European Spring of 1989. And indeed, the Romanian Revolution forms part of that spring. But I thought with um, this occasion, I might introduce a personal note into my talk by incorporating some eyewitness accounts of um, my experiences in Bucharest at the time of the revolution, or at least after the execution of Nicolae Ceausescu uh, on the 25th of December, because before that date, um, I wasn't allowed to go to Romania for a a year or so because I was declared persona non grata. So um, I can inject, I feel, um, some uh, vivid accounts of um, what happened in the revolution, especially after Ceausescu's execution, and I'll recount them from the text which I prepared. So from 16th of December 1989 until the 10th of January 1990, I was fortunate enough to be invited by John Simpson, the chief foreign affairs correspondent of BBC television, to be his principal advisor on the events unfolding in Romania. This position involved acting as an anchor for him in his office in London until the 28th of December, when he asked me to join him in Bucharest. I could not travel out with him because I was persona non grata, as I've just said, to the regime of Nicolae Ceausescu that is, until the dictator's overthrow. As anchor in London, I had access to the reports from the major international news agencies as they came through on a teleprinter, as well as to television feeds from camera crews from 36 international TV companies dispersed around Romania. When I finally reached Bucharest on the 28th of December, I accompanied John and his crew, occasionally under sniper fire, to film and conduct interviews with citizens and key figures in the revolution. This paper is informed by my experience and addresses some of the questions that still remain unanswered about those days. My starting point is an examination of the conditions which led to the overthrow of Ceausescu. I shall then move on to describe briefly the events of the period 16th to the 25th of December and attempt to address some of the questions I mentioned. Finally, I shall consider whether we are justified in describing these events as a revolution. Here, just a map of Romania to explain to you its uh, territorial expanse um, <coughs> since 1918. And uh, I shall be referring to some of these towns of Romania as I go along. So, it was failure in the economic field that was the principal reason behind the Romanians' growing, frust growing disillusionment with Ceausescu. To a certain extent, he became a victim of the regime's economic achievements of the 1960s. Expectations of an ever brighter economic future were raised by the increasing availability of consumer goods in the late 1960s. And when, com and when cutbacks became the order of the day in the 1970s and 80s, these hopes were rudely shattered. In the light of Ceausescu's admiration for Stalin, 
it is not surprising that economic policy should have been characterized by Ceausescu's obsession with industrialization and total opposition to any form of private ownership. He was, therefore, all the more irritated that the champion of economic reforms in the Eastern Bloc in 1985 should be the new Soviet leader, Mikhail Gorbachev. But his implacable opposition to change was expressed at the November 1985 Romanian Communist Party Central Committee meeting. Ceausescu had turned to the West for loans, for the com uh, for loans but the country's creditworthiness had been assessed on an over-optimistic estimate of its ability to repay through exports, since many of these proved to be of poor quality. Not only did the exports fail to generate the anticipated income, but the energy-intensive heavy industry plants became increasingly voracious due to inefficient running. In the mid-1970s, Ceausescu expanded Romania's oil refining capacity in excess of the country's own domestic output, and in 1976 was forced to begin the import of crude oil. When the price of oil soared on the international market in 78, Romania was caught out and soon faced a major trade deficit. Her problem was exacerbated by the revolution in Iran, a chief supplier to Romania of oil, which put a halt to deliveries. Nature was also against the regime. A severe earthquake of 77, followed by floods in 1980 and 81, disrupted industrial production and reduced the export of foodstuffs, which Ceausescu now looked to in order to pay off the foreign debt incurred through industrialization. More importantly, the very act of having to accept conditions from the Western banks was a great blow to the Romanian leader's inflated pride. On its heels came political isolation, which made him less dependent on the support of foreign governments that might have, that might have exercised some influence in persuading him to moderate his policies towards his people. He declared defiantly in December 82 that he would pay off the foreign debt by 1990, and to achieve this, introduced a series of austerity measures unparalleled even in the bleak history of Central European communist regimes. Rationing of bread, flour, sugar, and milk was introduced in some provincial towns in early 82, and in 83 it was extended to most of the country, with the exception of the capital. The monthly personal rations were progressively reduced to the point where, on the eve of the 1989 revolution, they were in some reason, regions of the country two pounds of sugar, two pounds of flour, a half pound pack of margarine, and five eggs. At the same time, heavy industry was also called upon to contribute to the export drive. But because its energy needs outstripped the country's capacity, drastic energy saving measures were introduced in 1981, which included a petrol or a gas ration of some seven gallons per month for private car owners. Other strictures stipulated a maximum temperature of 55 degrees in offices and periods of provision of hot water, normally one day a week in flats or in apartments. In the winter of 83, these restrictions were extended, causing the interruption of the electricity supply in major cities and reduction of gas pressure during the day so that meals could only be cooked at night. The spark which ignited Yes, these are some of the points I've just made. <coughs> the spark which ignited the revolution came from Timisoara. It was produced by parishioners protesting against the eviction of Hungarian reform church pastor Laszlo Turkesh, a persistent critic of Ceausescu's policies, from his home in the city. On the 28th of November 1989, Turkesh was informed that his appeal, <coughs> that his appeal for eviction had been turned down and that the eviction would be enforced on the 15th of December. As Christmas approached, parishioners brought gifts of food to the sacristy in groups and afterwards gathered outside Turkish's flat next to the church to show their support. On the day of the eviction, a human chain was formed around the block in which he lived and the militia were unable to gain access. The vigil held in support of Turkish on the 15th of December uh, the uh, Timisoara, by the way, is, is down there, okay, where the aircraft is. So the vigil held in support of Turkish on the 15th of December turned into a major demonstration on the following day. 
Some of the protesters attempted to enter the Communist Party county headquarters, but the building was deserted and the doors locked, so they turned their attention to nearby shops and set fire to volumes of Ceausescu speeches looted from a bookshop. Eventually, the security forces dispersed them with water cannon. Fresh crowds gathered in the morning of the 17th of, Dece of, 17th of December in the centre of the city and moved towards the local party headquarters, which they found protected by a double cordon of troops and fire engines. As the crowd advanced, one of the engines came to meet it and sprayed it with water, thus infuriating the protesters who pushed the troops back, thereby allowing some demonstrators to break into the building. The youths ransacked the lower floors before the security forces forced them out. Most of the crowd streamed back towards the Hotel Continental to join hundreds of other protesters throwing stones and petrol bombs. The army garrison was also attacked and furniture from it seized and set on fire. It was amidst this chaos that in the late afternoon the first gunshots were heard and the first victims of the revolution fell. A stream of senior army and securitate, that is secret police officers, were sent from the capital to put down the protests, including Lieutenant General Victor Stankulescu, there's his name at the top of the slide there, and, uh, and Lieutenant General Mihai Kitsak, who was the head of the chemical troops and commander of the Bucharest garrison. Live ammunition was distributed to the troops as the security forces moved to the offensive. Demonstrators were shot dead in the city centre, near the cathedral, and in the opera square, as well as in the suburbs. Tanks abandoned by the army were retrieved after the army fired upon protesters. The violent repression left more than 60 civilians dead and more than 200 wounded. About 700 persons were arrested. Despite the crisis facing his regime, Ceausescu flew to Iran on the morning of the 18th of December for a three-day state visit. He was probably persuaded to go ahead with the visit by the promise of signing contracts for the sale of arms to the Iranians, estimated to be worth more than $2 billion. His wife, Elena, was left in charge of the situation at home to be assisted by Politburo members Mania Manescu and Emil Bobu. Yet Ceausescu's absence undermined any authority which his regime had maintained and even ignited rumours that he had taken substantial gold reserves to Iran as insurance against possible flight. In an effort to hide evidence of those murdered by the army, the bodies of 40 civilians were taken from the Timisoara mortuary on Elena, on Elena Ceausescu's orders, as rumour had it, and heaped into a refrigerated lorry which then took them first to the local militia headquarters and then on to Bucharest, where they were cremated and the ashes scattered at the entrance to a canal. Such treatment of the bodies was regarded as unchristian by the largely devout Orthodox po population and certainly fueled hostility to the regime, at the same time adding confusion to calculations of the exact numbers of dead from the 17th and 18th of December. More demonstrators died in Timisoara on the 19th of December as thousands of factory workers reported for work but joined in sympathy strikes with colleagues who had gone on strike elsewhere in the city. On the 20th of December, tens of thousands of workers decided to come out of the factory gates and join forces in a mass march to the Opera Square in the city centre. There, although confronted by lines of troops and armoured vehicles, they surged forward and with shouts of, we are the people, the army is on our side, and uh, Ceausescu will fall, they embraced the soldiers, stuffing flags in the turrets of the armoured personnel carriers and tanks, and handing flowers, cigarettes and bread to the young soldiers. From that moment, the regime could no longer count on the army to defend it. Timisoara was, some of the crowd claim, a free city. The crowd moved forward towards the Opera House, and as troops withdrew to a side street, entry was made through a back door. At this point, some eyewitnesses report that a certain Claudio Yordake made an emo emotional appeal to the ar for the army to withdraw. Others state that the first person to address them from the Opera House balcony, where a loudspeaker system already set up, 
in anticipation uh, that the Prime Minister Konstantin de Scalescu would address the crowd was Lorine Fortuna, a professor at Timisoara Polytechnic. His speech, delivered at around 2 p.m., was followed by a succession of others from factory representatives urging the crowd, estimated at about 40,000 persons, to remain united. In the evening of the 20th of December, after his return from Iran, Ceausescu addressed the nation on radio and television. The, viewers, the, the viewing public must have been dismayed to see a tired, fossilized Ceausescu flanked by his stone-faced wife and surrounded by a dinosaur-like group of Politburo members. The sight hardly evinced authority, rather the weakening of a grip on power. Ceausescu blamed the violence on a few, I quote, hooligan elements, and claimed that behind Turkesh lay, I quote, foreign spy agencies, principally Budapest, because he, that is Turkesh, also gave an interview. In fact, the facts are well known. This is, these are Ceausescu's words. Moreover, it is known that in both the East and as well as in the West, everyone is saying that things ought to change in Romania. Both East and West have decided to change things, and they are using any means possible. End of quote. The broadcast had a profoundly <coughs> negative effect upon many viewers, especially the young. Protesters in Timisoara were, were infuriated be, to be described as stooges of the foreign power. After Ceausescu's defiant broadcast that evening, the spokesperson of citizens in Timisoara, Fortuna, established the following morning the Romanian Democratic Front, with himself at the head. The protesters in Timisoara had effectively brought an end to Ceausescu's dictatorship, and that two days before Ceausescu fled from Bucharest. Thus, for two days, there were dual centers of power, of power in Romania, one established by the anti-Ceausescu Romanian Democratic Front in Timisoara, the other in the Central Committee building in Bucharest. The hostility to Ceausescu unleashed in Timisoara <coughs> quickly spread to neighboring towns and then into Transylvania. Only in Altania and Moldavia did towns remain largely quiet, with bemused citizens in Pitesht, for example, aimlessly milling around and limply dangling pro ceausescu banners when the address of Ceausescu, due to be relayed that morning to the main square from the capital, was abruptly abandoned. In Cluj, 26 demonstrators were shot dead by army units on the 21st of December. Um, let me see if I can find the map again here, just to point out. So Pitesht is um, down here, there, where the crowd was aimlessly milling around, and uh, Cluj is over here, where more than 20 young demonstrators were shot dead by the army. <coughs> Judge, in retrospect, uh, Ceausescu Yes, judged in retrospect, Ceausescu made three fatal errors. In his broadcast of the 20th of December, he completely misjudged the mood of the people by displaying no hint of compassion for the victims of Timisoara and by dismissing the demonstrations as the work of fascists and hooligan, uh, hooligan elements inspired by Hungarian irredentism. With echoes in his ears of the people's acclamation of his speech of the 21st of August 1968, denouncing the Warsaw Pact invasion of Czechoslovakia, he made his second mistake. He convened a public meeting of support on the 21st of, of December in Bucharest, in an atmosphere this time of public disgust at his lack of humanity. Selected by factory, workers were taken by bus to the square the following morning, equipped with the usual banners for party, or party orchestrated meetings, proclaiming peace, Ceausescu and the people, Ceausescu equals the Romanian Communist Party. Ceausescu began to speak at 12.30. Scarcely had he begun with a few introductory remarks than, to his bewilderment, a disturbance in the crowd off camera and high-pitched screams caused him to break off his speech. The live television and radio coverage was cut, but not before Ceausescu's confusion had been captured, captured by the cameras and transmitted to the thousands watching on television. For the first time in the history of the communist regime in Romania, a stage-managed address by its leader had been interrupted in full view of the public. 
it proved to be a fatal blow, first to Ceausescu and second to his entire regime. On the following morning of the 22nd of December, Ceausescu committed his third error. He summoned yet another public meeting of support and attempted to address it at half past 11. Boos and, uh, boos and stones were directed at the balcony of the Central Committee building and judged in retrospect, sorry, uh, Central Committee building, and Ceausescu was ushered inside by the head of his personal bodyguard. He fled from the rooftop in a helicopter accompanied by his wife and two of his closest allies, Mania Menescu and Emil Bodu, Bobu, and two bodyguards. Ceausescu ordered the helicopter pilot to land at Snagov some 20 miles to the north of Bucharest. Let's uh, retrieve the map again. And um, in fact, all of the Vestagovish uh, days, they're gone just down here. So Ceausescu ordered the helicopter pilot to land at Snagov some 20 miles to the north of Bucharest, where he had a country mansion. And it was from here that he and his wife collected a suitcase of clothing. Menescu and Bobu remained behind as the helicopter took off once more with the Ceausescus and the bodyguards, first, according to the pilot, in the direction of the helicopter base at Otopen, which is just down here where the aircraft is, <coughs> um, but the, uh, and then on Ceausescu's instructions to the parachutist base at Boten, which is, is over here, so it's not located exactly on the map. <coughs> But the pilot was told by the commandant at Boten that he could not land. The pilot received orders to tell Ceausescu that he was short of fuel and fearful of being spotted by radar. And so Ceausescu ordered him to put down on a main road, some 25 miles to the south of the town of Turgoviste. And the Turgoviste is over there, you can see. The bodyguards flagged down a car driven by a doctor who took them as far as a village just outside Togoviste, where the doctor's car ran out of fuel, forcing the bodyguards to commandeer a second car, this one belonging to an engineer. This is uh, quite ironic, of course, because of the fuel restrictions that there were in Romania at that time. The uh, second car took them to the steelworks at Togoviste there, <coughs> where a bodyguard got out to seek, all, seek local party assistance but did not return. The bodyguard ran off. And <laughs> uncertain, <laughs> uncertain what to do with the presidential couple, uh, the driver decided to drive to a nearby agricultural experimental station where the manager, bewildered and frightened, shut them away in a room and summoned the local police. The two policemen took them to the Turgoviste police headquarters where the secret police also had a base. But crowds blocked the entrance and so the car could not, carrying the Ceausescu's, could not enter. The policemen then drove the couple to a nearby village where they tried to remain out of sight in some reeds by a lake until the commotion in Togoviste died down. On being informed that relative calm had been restored by an army unit around the police station in Togoviste, they returned to headquarters in the early evening and the Ceausescu's were then taken to the army garrison in the town. On the 25th of December, after a mockery of a trial, they were sentenced to death and shot by firing squad in the grounds of the garrison. The ubiquity of snipers who were active in the center of Bucharest after the 22nd of December, that is after Ceausescu's flight, spawned a host of rumors about their aims and allegiance. Indeed, rumor factories were the only institutions which, alongside the secret police, had worked overtime during Ceausescu's rule. On the streets and in the press, the snipers were generally dubbed terrorists, or terrorists in Romania. A team of three or four men broke into the residence of the British ambassador opposite the Romanian TV studios and sprayed the studios for more than an hour before tank fire reduced the residence to a burnt-out shell. The government, the government were never caught. This incident can be catalogued alongside the sudden explosion of gunfire which erupted in the main square facing the Central Committee building on the evening of the 22nd of December, just as the crowd was being addressed by a series of speakers expressing their condemnation of the Ceausescu regime. Who carried out the attack 
which left the building pockmarked with bullet holes and set the adjacent university library on fire has never been established. It left several people dead and some argue that it was a diversion staged in order to give credibility to the existence of counter-revolutionary forces who were attempting to restore the dictator to power and therefore to give legitimation to the creation of the National Salvation Front, proclaimed barely hours earlier by Jan Iliescu. This view sat comfortably with the argument that a popular revolt begun in Timisoara was hijacked by second echelon communists led by Iliescu and turned into a revolution. Others went further and claimed that the events in Timisoara were the first step in a conspiracy led by anti-Ceausescu communists fronted by Iliescu to overthrow Ceausescu but to maintain communists, if not the party, in power. Many Romanians felt that they had been duped and that the sacrifice made in December 89 had been to no avail. Their view may be summed up in the, in the verdict that while the Communist Party was declared dead in January 1990, no one ever produced a death certificate. They pointed to the presence of Lieutenant General Stankulescu, the first Deputy Minister of Defence under Ceausescu, in the National Salvation Front Provisional Government. Stankulescu, who had played, it was proved later, a prominent role in the repression by the army of demonstrations in Timisoara on the 17th and 18th of December, was appointed Minister of the National Economy on the 28th of December and held the position until the 16th of February 1990 when he became Minister of Defence. My presence in Bucharest with the BBC after the 28th of December affords me another reminiscence of the aftermath of the revolution while indeed involving Stankulescu. On the 6th of January I was with the actor Ion Karamitru who together with the poet Mircea Dinescu had been amongst the first figures to appear on Romanian TV after Ceausescu's flight from Bucharest with an emotional appeal to support the revolution. Karamitru was an old friend of mine and on learning of my presence in Bucharest with the BBC invited me to the seat of the provisional government in the centre of Bucharest where he had been given an office. Whilst we were talking the phone rang and Karamitru picked it up. At the other end of the line was General Stankulescu, who asked me to pay him a visit and give me his location, and gave me his location. He did not have transport available for me and asked Karamitru to provide a vehicle from the government pool. I agreed to go and jumped into a jeep that was waiting for me at the entrance to the government headquarters. The driver then requested me to give him directions to Stankulescu's office. He explained that he had been drafted in from the provinces, together with other drivers, since the new government did not trust the, com the Communist Party drivers who had been laid off, and that he was unfamiliar with the geography of Bucharest. Fortunately, I knew how to get to the General's office. Upon my arrival, I was escorted by two armed guards in civilian clothes up to the fourth floor of a building on Calia Victoriae and ushered into Stenkolescu's room. He too was in Mufti. He explained that he wanted to get an urgent message to the British government, but since the British ambassador had withdrawn to Sofia, did not know whom to contact in Bucharest. He had been told that I was in the capital with the BBC and asked me to pass his message on. It was a request for medicines, food, and assistance with, restore, with restoring the country's energy, that is, electrical generating capacity. I told my boss, John Simpson, about the message, and he transmitted it by satellite link to London. During my meeting with Stankulescu, I seized the opportunity to ask him about his actions on the 22nd of December, the day of Ceausescu's flight. My account of them is based on my own notes, written immediately after my return to the Intercontinental Hotel from the meeting. The General's account was largely consistent with one which he gave in 2005. He told me that he had been informed on the 22nd of December by Army Telephone, which he had at home, that he should go to the Central Committee building. General Vasile Milia, the Minister of Defence, was still alive. Stankulescu had come from the hospital where he put his leg in, in uh, plaster, hoping that he wouldn't be asked by Ceausescu to involve himself 
in the revolution any further. The officer on the phone told him that the minister, that is the minister of defense, wanted to see him at the central committee. Shortly afterwards, the officer phoned again to say that something had happened at the central committee without saying what it was and that Stenkalescu should go there straight away. Then a car came, sent by Silvio Corticianu, the head of Ceausescu's office, with two or three men from the personal bodyguard, that's the fifth directorate of the Securitate, who told Stenkalescu that Corticianu had sent them to pick him up immediately and take him to the Central Committee building. They told Stenkalescu on the way that the defense minister had committed suicide. Stankalescu went up to the first floor of the Central Committee and was met by Kurtichanu, that's Ceausescu's personal secretary, who told him that the comrades, that was the term they always used, Tavarushi in Romanian, that is the two Ceausescu's, were waiting for him. The latter uh, but were waiting indeed, not in Ceausescu's office, but in, uh, but in the ante room, and asked Stankalescu, remember I'm recounting what Stankalescu told me, uh, what's wrong with you, what kept you? Stankalescu replied that he had injured his leg in an accident and that it was in a cast. Ceausescu said, Milia has betrayed us and has committed suicide. Stankalescu said they were already panicking. Here's the situation, said Ceausescu. Um, there are some army units which are to come to the square, that is in front of the Central Committee building. Find out where they are, he directed Stankalescu, and when they are coming. Stankalescu learned that two regiments, one of tanks, the other of armoured vehicles, had indeed set out for the square on the orders of the now defunct Minister of Defence. Stankalescu left the room and in the communication centre found a captain and asked him discreetly, are you in contact with the two units? At his reply that he was, Stankalescu ordered him, pass on my order that they should return to barracks. Stankalescu then went back to report to the Ceausescu and told them that the two units were in fact on their way. Stankalescu, having returned to the Ceausescu's, um, <clears throat> said that pressure in the square was growing nevertheless. In my opinion, he said, it would be better if you left the building. <coughs> How can we leave, Ceausescu replied, and in what, they asked. The only solution now is by helicopter, Stankalescu said, without knowing that there was not enough open space on the roof of the Central Committee building because of the aerials which the security, the Securitate, had to dismantle to allow a helicopter to land. A second helicopter, which Ceausescu would hope would come as well, had nowhere to land. The Ceausescu's went back to their office, spoke with their secretary, Kurtichanu, and then with someone else there whom Stankalescu could not recall. The idea of the helicopters had come, Stankalescu recounted to me, around 11.15. The Ceausescu's had gone into the president's office, that is Ceausescu's main office, but Stankalescu could see they were frightened. Um, <coughs> Stankalescu telephoned General Rus, who was the commander of the Romanian Air Force, uh, and told, them to, uh, told him to produce a helicopter. Uh, and indeed, Rus said that a helicopter uh, would arrive. And eventually, the helicopter, or one helicopter, did land on the Central Committee building and the Ceausescu's were, were taken off, accompanied by the three bodyguards, uh, one of whom they left at Snagov, and the other two, as I've as I recounted to you, went on until they eventually deserted the Ceausescu's near Turgovishtin. Stankalescu's revelations to me of his actions on the 22nd of December, and I repeat, I noted them down immediately after seeing him, is, I believe, one of, the, one of his earliest accounts of them. And for that reason, I present them here to you. They highlight the ambiguity of the situation in which senior figures in the army found themselves. The events of the December 89 showed that the forces of the Securitate, the militia and the army, were only as efficient as their weaknesses allowed them to be. They were not trained in dealing with crowd control, and the heavy-handed actions of the army resulted in the deaths of many of the 1,100 or so official victims of the revolution. The controversy about the revolution, and whether in fact there was a revolution, is reflected in its historiography. <coughs> here uh, is a sample of views, and I put some up on the PowerPoint here. Someone said, should we call this a revolution? 
After all, a revolution involves violence. In fact, we always have to qualify it. We call it velvet. We call it peaceful. We call it evolutionary. I call it, Timothy Art and Ash's words, revolution, a mixture of revolution and reform. Curiously enough, the moment when people in the West finally thought there was a revolution was when they saw pictures of Romania, crowds, tanks, shooting, blood in the streets. They said, that we know, that is a revolution. And of course, the joke is that it was the only one that wasn't. Ruxanda Cesareanu, <clears throat> in her study of the December Revolution, tried to place the various accounts of the revolution in three categories. The first of those who believe in a straightforward, successful mass uprising against the dictatorship. The second of those who believe in a coup d'etat, carried out by either internal or external forces. And the third of those who believe in a combination of these two explanations. Were then the events of December 89 in Romania a revolution? Following Peter Siani Davis' analysis, and Peter Siani Davis has written uh, a very authoritative, I believe, a monograph on the revolution. The word revolution is associated with two popular metaphors. The first is that it's a relatively quick and violent single incident, conventionally distinguished by a time-related epithet, such as the October Revolution in Russia or the February Revolution of 1848 in Paris. And his analysis would, I quote, argue that the Romanian Revolution of 89 might be added to this list. Secondly, the idea of revolution can embrace a longer process of social change, often spanning many decades, in which it is usually referred to in more general terms, such as the Russian, French, or Chinese revolution, end of quote. It can be argued that there was a rupture in sovereignty in Romania, represented by the transfer of power from the Romanian Communist Party to the National Salvation Front. There were competing centers of power in Timisoara after the establishment of the Romanian Democratic Front on the 20th of December in opposition to the remnants of the Communist Party organizations in the County Council building. Indeed, such a duality of power can be extrapolated to distinguish Timisoara from the rest of the country in the period 20th to the 25th of December. Are we to disqualify the use of the term revolution in the Romanian context because there was no rupture in continuity. That is to say that the, Roma that the communists simply took over power again. Or is it, that we, uh, is it that some see the authenticity of a revolution defined not only in policy change, but also in a change of mentality? We can dismiss the notion that Nicolae Ceausescu's overthrow was a coup d'etat. As has been pointed out, Eric Honecker in East Germany Tudor Zhivkov in Bulgaria and Milos Jakes in Czechoslovakia were all victims of palace coups. And had Ceausescu been removed after the December, the, after the December 17th Politburo meeting and replaced by a fellow member, he could have been placed in that category. But his retreat from the center of Bucharest in the face of vociferous protests bears the mark of revolution, as does the mass mobilization widespread violence, spontaneous creation of revolutionary institutions, the breakdown of a revolutionary coalition, and subsequent fierce struggle between the revolutionary contenders on the streets of Romania's cities. Uh, I quoted, as you can see there, from uh, Peter Siani Davis. The violent manner of Ceausescu's demise set Romania's experience of political change apart from that of the other Central European states, and was itself an indication that in Romania the peaceful overthrow of dictatorship was impossible. Whereas Ceausescu succeeded in uniting Romanians in opposition to him, his fall threw them into confusion. The legacy of totalitarian rule in Romania was therefore markedly different from that elsewhere. In the words of one of the young revolutionaries wearing the tricolor armband of red, yellow, and blue, whom I met guarding the entrance to a Bucharest metro station shortly after my arrival in late December 1989, his words were, we want real democracy, not Romanian democracy. The miners' incursions into Bucharest after the revolution in 1990 and 1991 
bore the hallmarks of the tactics used by the communists in Romania in 1945 and elsewhere in Central Europe to, to, to subvert democratic order and bring themselves to power. Yet the overthrow of Ceausescu did lead to a political revolution. A single party monopoly was removed. Multi-party elections, albeit flawed in 1990, were held. The command economy was dismantled and censorship was abolished. There was a democratic transfer of power in 1996 when the neo-communists suffered their first defeat at the ballot box since 1990. At the personal level, possession of a passport became a right, not a privilege, in early 1990, and therefore restrictions on travel abroad by the state were removed, and the reviled abortion decree introduced by Ceausescu was immediately rescinded. Still, the, law, the rule of law is fragile, and the reform of the judicial system continues to be needed. The political will to bring senior politicians to court to face credible charges of corruption is wanting. Whether there has been a revolution in mentality in Romania is questionable. What I think the revolution in Romania does demonstrate is that the heroes die, the fighters go home, and the opportunists come to the fore. Thank you. <laughs> very much. That's quite a remarkable story. That must have been very exciting yes. <laughs> days that you spent there. Um, before I throw it open, I have one question for you. How much did the general Romanian population know about the overthrow of communism in Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and East Germany? I mean, obviously the leadership knew yeah. that, but how much did the general population know, or were they really shielded from most of that? Um, they knew a good deal because uh, they could pick up uh, Radio Free Europe, Voice of America, the BBC. And um, in Transylvania in particular, many Romanians listened to Hungarian TV, which they could get. In Bucharest, they uh, often tuned into Bulgarian TV, believe it or not. And one of the things that amused me when I got to Bucharest in late December was the, the number of Bulgarian Romanian dictionaries, pocket dictionaries, that seem to be <laughs> circulating in Romania. And I, I found this, um, you know, again, rather ironic because the Romanians under Ceausescu have played down the Cyrillic Slavonic right. connection. <laughs> and here were Bucharest population learning Bulgarian because they watched Bulgarian TV, which was much more entertaining. Interesting. And do we, how much evidence do we have that Ceausescu and the people around him thought that what had happened in all of these Central European countries? might happen to him or did was he did he live in such a I think an was, unreal yeah, world that he didn't yeah. I think he was so cocooned by yeah. the senior figures around him who were really afraid to speak out and to warn him and I think this is why um, why the frustration on the ground was transmitted in such a violent fashion because they hadn't managed to um, persuade the regime to relax to any degree, the restrictions that were placed in on the, really on the population from the early 1990s. Thank you. Questions, comments? <coughs> yes, our former <laughs> young Ratsu professor, <laughs> Professor Charles King. Thank, thanks very much, Charles. It was just a great, a great talk. Um, you hinted at this issue of uh, you know how you answered the, the question China who, yeah. who who was doing the, the, the shooting at the time. So where do you think the status of that debate is, and where where do you come come down on it? There are so many conspiracy theories of you know special troops of Palestinian uh, yeah. uh, you know, snipers who were trained by Ceausescu. Yeah. How, how do you see that? Well, I I you found know. it uh, very difficult. Um, to get to the bottom of the problem because indeed in different parts of Bucharest people were firing. For example, I mentioned the incident involving the British ambassador's residence where um, uh, because the ambassador had left, or he left because of that incident because he was fearful for his family's safety, he went to Sofia. And when I went up to the residence with the BBC camera crew to to film, we asked uh, bystanders, people who lived opposite the the house, well, who were these gunmen? Now, they, they, their view was that they were these special troops, you know, the special anti-terrorist unit, 
who had set up a machine gun on the roof of the, the residence and were hoping to dislodge or create chaos in the Romanian TV station. But I, uh, when I went to the TV station shortly afterwards again with a camera crew, I asked the army commander who was there whether he thought they were uh, anti-terrorist troops, and he said, I simply don't know, which I thought was an honest answer. And we, we, we still can't quite get to the bottom of this. Um, one, of the interest, one of the difficulties is that after the revolution, there were these, I think it was something like 600 people detained for allegedly possessing firearms. Uh, and they were all released without any charges being brought uh, on the orders of uh, Mugurel Florescu, who was the military prosecutor. So had these figures been interrogated um, intensely, we might have got some answer as to where they came from, who they were, whose orders they were obeying, whether they were obeying any orders. But it's believed that these 600 were certainly involved, and many of them were involved in the sniping that was going on, but they were released, as they say, without charge. Yes, Ross. <laughs> Can you identify much. yourself, please, Ross? Ross Johnson. Yeah. Um, I was Director of Action for Radio Freedom during all those momentous <laughs> days. Um, very helpful, Dennis. Thank you very much. Um, the story of December '89 is, you know, it's it's usually the story of Timisoara and, and and Bucharest, and you you point out things that were happening elsewhere. And I wonder if, you know, could you say some more about that? Were you yourself able after you could go back to Romania to get to some of the other towns? Yes. Is there, I mean, is there decent? Is there some decent sorry his, historical accounts of what happened in individual cities? Yeah. There, there were a number of um, local accounts that were published um, in Romania, um, but your question is a very good one, Ross, because, of course, where things didn't happen, you're unlikely to get an account of what didn't happen. And what struck me was when I was faced with this bank of, I mentioned, 36 monitors in the BBC headquarters, I mean, there, was e there were even television camera crews from the Soviet Union in different towns transmitting uh, as well as one from Libyan television as well. <laughs> and so I got a snapshot of what was happening in Pitesh. That's how I was able to recount that people were wandering around aimlessly. But also in some of the other towns in Moldova, in Baku, for example, yeah. where people were simply um, bemused. As I say, they didn't know how to react. The local party officials didn't know how to react because they were taken completely by surprise. Um, you could see on the TV monitors in Pitesh, for example, people hanging the or holding these pro Ceausescu banners very limply, although it was clear that they'd been drafted into the town to stage a demonstration in favor of Ceausescu, but um, because of what they'd seen on the TV, which was being broadcast on the 22nd of December, they decided or been told not to, in order not to. But in a good part of the country, there was, from what I can tell, um, no support for the revolution at all. I mean, that doesn't mean to say people were anti-revolution, but their support was not manifested, if indeed they did support it. They were, they were completely thrown by what was happening in Bucharest. Yes. Alison Dalton. Um, Dennis, there's a film that I actually haven't seen all of, but some of you probably have called something like East of Bucharest. Yes, yeah. Does that know, yes. speak to what you're saying about the confusion about what's yeah, really going on? Yeah, I, I think very much so, yes. Um, um, can I, just yeah. to a related question, the people in this film are sort of middle-aged, uh, ordinary people, but it's always an assumption that it's the university students and the young workers who are out there yeah. uh, staging revolutions. And it seems, you know, as though that was partly true, but I wanted to ask your thoughts a little bit about where memory plays into this. I mean, how many people involved in these demonstrations were around when Ceausescu started mm -hmm. his career, for example, yeah. of, which seemed to be a good start, yes. as far as I yeah. know. Um, what, you know. What role does mm -hmm. history and knowledge yes, play? Uh, um, the, the generation of Ceausescu were on our own termed in Romanian the decret say that the children of his abortion decree yeah. era in yeah. fact 
and it's precisely some of those children that participated in the demonstrations. But they were a very mixed group, I, I found, in Bucharest. Um, uh, for example, uh, what struck me was the number of Romas who took part in the storming of the Central Committee building, because we interviewed a number of them after the event. And while I was in London, when the storming of the Central Committee took place on the morning of the 22nd of December, I could tell myself or guess that um, some of the uh, people who'd entered the building, quite bravely in fact, because some 60 members of the personal bodyguard were inside and were armed. So these intruders had no way, they were weaponless, so they had no means of knowing whether the bodyguard would respond. Um, to their intrusion, but it, it did strike me that many of them were young uh, Romas who had said, well, we're tired of this regime and uh, let's join in the, the um, attack on the building. Um, I think in Brasov, uh, when they uh, attacked the Central Committee building there, there was m more older people involved. There weren't that many young people as far as I can tell from what my friends in Brasov have told me. But going back to your point, Charles, about Palestinians, the, um, there were indeed some Palestinians, I was told, authoritatively, authoritatively being trained uh, up in Bran, where the Securitate had training for their anti-terrorist unit. And allegedly, some of these were snipers, some of these Palestinians, I think there were 30 of them, had fired in various places in the address on the crowd. But they were spirited out of Bucharest uh, pretty quickly. Yeah, Lewis Reed. Uh, sure. Dennis, I'm curious the extent to which the Securitate files have been opened for inspection <coughs> by news people and by ordinary citizens. I'm aware that in Germany, for example, I have a good friend in Hamburg, and there they've been opened. He has no interest in looking at them. He's quite sure that he and his wife both have files. And I think the Czechs weren't yes, interested in looking yeah. at them. Mm -hmm. The Poles are just getting around to it now. Yeah. What is the status in Romania? Yeah, um, maybe, uh, let's see if I can't find a, a file that says something about um, uh, the Securitate here. Well, that's just a map, but um, the uh, just a few slides I made up of the revolution and the, the role of the Securitate, which um, uh, has been distorted, I feel, because most of the victims who were shot there were shot dead both in Timisoara and in Bucharest by the army, not by the uh, Securitate, the secret police. Um, but I may have something... Oh, there's a typical piece of Ceausescu propaganda there. Um, the Golden Age, that reels, uh, that uh, reads there, the Epoca de Al. Um, I thought I, I may have had... This is a footballer who was accused of being an informer, uh, rather exaggerated, um, but uh, I'm trying to find, well, let me answer your, your question, Louis. By the way, you may be aware that Herta Muller, the Nobel Prize winner, is a Romanian citizen, and um, it's a photo of her with her, uh, an informer. Um, access is, uh, is free for um, researchers. Um, there is a problem in the sense of an administrative one because there have been so many um, requests for uh, access to the Securitate files that the 320 employees of the council that administers the Securitate files, which are something like 21 kilometers of files, have difficulty administering, as I say, processing the applications. If you add to that the fact that there are various pieces of legislation passed in Romania since 1999 which um, allow you to claim, or you or your family, um, to claim compensation if you were a political prisoner. But in order to claim that compensation, you have to have a certificate from the council uh, for administering the Securitate archives. So they had last year some 10,000 requests for these documents, for, for um, affidavits for citizens to claim compensation. Add those 10,000 to the 
I don't know, 2,000 applications they get a year for permits to count to, to use the archives. And you can see that it takes a long time to get permission to use them. But many of them, or, uh, but many of the files are open now. They're, they're classified according to the nature of the, the subject. And there are some, indeed, that are not open, but they're not open on the grounds of national security. This is the, this is the, um, the term that's used by the Romanian national security considerations prevent access to some files. And also, if a person in a file is still what the Romanians call operational, you can see the person's file under certain conditions up to 1989 because the file covers the period of communist rule but you can't see the file of the person if they're operational beyond 1990 so mm. there are a number of um, conditions but you find them Lewis on the on the CNSAS website just go on to it and it will tell you what category of files is open for access. Can I understand that uh, Professor Catherine Verder is writing about her own Securitate files? Have you had the I have mixed pleasure of yeah, uh, I've uh, sat, uh, uh, yeah, I've got my file. Obtaining one's own yeah. file? <laughs> have oh, file. Yeah, wow. I have my file, yeah. Uh, and indeed, uh, Catherine, reflect your memories? <laughs> yeah, Catherine was in touch with me about uh, project. Yeah, I thought of writing about it. Um, I'm just too lazy, I suppose, to do <laughs> with other things. But it, it didn't really have any shocks because I knew who was, I guessed who was informing me. So, um, uh, I, I'll get round to writing about it. Did they say nice things about it? Well, I thought <laughs> the, uh, well, I thought their reports were were quite objective, in fact. I mean, not all of them. Uh, um, <laughs> I mean, that I was uh, up to no good and, um, you know, I was consorting with dissidents and various right. things. Um, but, uh, yeah, there were, there were one or two scurrilous reports, I think, but on the whole, they, I thought they did a professional job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, uh, indeed, when I, um, when I, took some materials out in 1986 from uh, Cornelio Coposu, who was the head of, or had been the secretary of the National Peasant Party leader back in 1947, and he asked me to bring some materials to Western Europe, and I took them out. Um, but in, on the evening of my taking them out, the, the security party officer invited me to, to dinner in the evening, and said to me, Dennis, because he knew me through his father, who'd been a cultural attaché back in the 60s in London. But he said, I know you're going to take something out, which you shouldn't. Make sure they don't find it, um, because I'll be in trouble if they do. And they didn't find it. But it shows you how the system operated. This was an officer warning me. Um, and I wouldn't say I was a friend, but at least I didn't consider him an enemy or an adversary. He was, I thought, doing a good deed, you know, by alerting me. So there are a lot of um, nuances you need to put in interpreting some of the actions of figures. I know that between 79 and 84, there was almost a daily withdrawal of a food commodity, and that the rations were critically reduced day by day, week by week. From 85 to 88, I know it became worse. First yeah. knowledge, but I know it became much worse. After Ceausescu's sudden departure, how long did it take the new government to get food distributed? I've never heard that phase of the yeah. recovery. How long did it take to get food out? Because people were starving. Um, they, they acted pretty quickly, but they, they were helped very much by the European Union. Um, at the time of the revolution, or on January the 1st, 1990, France took over the presidency of the European Union. Um, and in fact, the British and Germans were, West Germans were very upset because instead of saying food aid was sent by the European Union, the French said it was all sent by the government of France. <laughs> um, I'm shocked to hear that. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, 
but um, uh, the, the European Union got into action very quickly. Um, you may recall this Operation Village Rumen, this grassroots um, NGO organization which had been set up originally in Belgium to twin villages in the European Union with villages in Romania. And because that network had been established since 88, so after the revolution immediately, say a local mayor in West Germany or in Belgium or somewhere, very many of them already had a contact and a name in a village. And they simply, the villagers in say a village in, near Brussels I know, they simply organized themselves convoys and took food to their village, mm -hmm. to their partner village. And the same happened in Britain, um, in France, throughout the European Union. And of course the United States also delivered aid. So all of this combined um, quickly, I think, uh, quickly rectified the situation. To follow that up, the average Romanian, especially out in the small villages, when the food came, was that their first realization that there was a change, or were there any laws or uh, prohibitions lifted immediately that they felt um, impacted their daily life? I think it probably was their first realization, yeah, in the village, yeah, because um, um, they, um, apart from those who had access to TVs, and, and so many Romanians uh, living, let's say, in the north of Moldova had difficulty accessing free, let's say, um, uh, a credible source of information, but um, these food uh, convoys were the first intimation that something uh, major had indeed um, transformed their lives. Uh, I, um, in, 19, in October 88, I drove to the north of uh, Romania, a Romanian friend took me there, and um, we uh, were flagged down uh, on one occasion by a policeman and my friend a Romanian panicked and thought oh my god you know we're going to be arrested because I was a foreigner in the car so he told me not to speak any Romanian uh, with him and I got into the back of the car and the policeman um, came into the car sat down and began cursing the regime <laughs> and Ceausescu and I was astonished and so was my friend um, he, he said but you know, why are you cursing the regime? You're a policeman. And the policeman said, because I have no gas for my car, I'm hitching a ride with you because I have to investigate, I have to investigate a robbery in the village back in the road. So that was oh October 88. Yeah. 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 Back again, back to information. I think we mentioned how the Romanians could learn about what was going on in Eastern Europe through the UN, BBC, RFP. But when we come to the revolution itself, these events, and before, um, before things changed in, in Romania, the tele television and, uh, and radio, um, then, then the question is, you know, how did information get passed around? Um, I mean, we know um, Information was conveyed in revolutions before there was social media, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yes. It happened in 1848. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, um, and you know, RFE and I assume BBC and VOA became kind of partial um, communication centers. You know, Romanians would call to them and back out. And yes. In some sense, it was easier to call out of Romania than within Romania mm -hmm. at that point. But I'm, I'm, I'm just curious, you know, in your sort of on, your experience, both with BBC, but then on the ground in, uh, in Romania, how, you know, how did people, you know, it's one thing to say rumor and rumor mill and A talks to BBC, but how, could, could you specify any more, you know, specifically how this may have, may have worked in those, in those crucial, you know, seven days, I guess? Um, I, in, there was a big difference between access to information, of course, in urban areas and in the rural areas. Mm. Um, and in fact, this difference, I think, was um, brought home to me during the election campaign in May 1990, because uh, I found that villagers um, were 
certainly had no access to the printed media. They didn't have newspapers. So they were reliant entirely on the TV. And now, in uh, the Ceausescu period, or the latter years of it, because TV only broadcast four hours a day, and much of it was pretty dire uh, material about the economic situation, so they didn't watch TV anymore, and they uh, retreated very much, as you say, into sort of rumour and gossip, relying on gossip from, say, a major town nearby, or from their relatives, particularly their children who'd been uh, who moved, who migrated to town, so that you got really a, tran a transition or um, the exchange of information coming from the younger generation working in the town as a result of the industrialization program and transmitting at the weekend uh, when they would go back to visit their parents news about what was happening in Pitesh, in Rashov, in Bucharest, but beyond that what was happening as I say, in the rest of Europe, via be it Bulgarian TV, uh, Hungarian TV, even Soviet TV up in uh, parts of northern Romania. Uh, and so all, all of those factors played, played in, I think, into producing some form of information, but some of it, of course, wasn't reliable, as we found out. Yeah. questions, comments? Am I right in assuming that there's never really been any systematic illustration? Uh, yes, I would say right. broadly that, that yeah. um, despite um, attempts to pass illustration, there hasn't been one that has got past the Constitutional Court. And even though there are provisions in other laws, such as um, the 1999 law that sets up the right of access to the Securitate files, and one of its clauses says that um, no one should uh, have the right to be a candidate for Parliament if it is shown that they were part of the phrase is the political police. Well, a number of people have been candidates for the Parliament since uh, 1999 who were not only part of the political police but officers in it. Um, uh, there's also this difficulty of, uh, with the um, with the files of actually establishing um, a complete picture of some alleged officer's activity, and that's because um, again this man uh, this manpower, manpower problem. Because I found uh, in 2004 I've been asked on several occasions to be an official observer for the Romanian elections by the OSCE. So that's how I get my information. Um, the, uh, in the 2004 elections, for example, we were blandly told that all the candidates had been scrutinized for membership or not of the Securitate. And so I thought, well, this is a grand claim. Um, I'll, and I had friends in the council for the administration of the archives, a couple of them were former students of mine. <laughs> so I said, come on now, you know, you don't expect us to believe this. And they said, well, yeah, that's right, it's not true. We simply didn't have time to scrutinize all the candidates. So we just said, <laughs> they all have the green light. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, okay, fine. Yeah, so. <laughs> Well, Dennis, I yeah. hope that you're going to publish what we yeah, told us about. Yeah, I haven't published this. Including, no, we'd love to read oh. your analysis for your own file. Yeah. It would be great. Yeah, and <laughs> you are all welcome. Please to stay to the reception afterwards. And please join me in thanking <laughs> Professor Bellatrix. <laughs>